talk to you today on the approach to the patient with excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, excessive daytime sleepiness can have a huge impact on our day-to-day -day life. It can have a very negative impact on a broad range of activities. Uh, it can pose safety risks, risks while driving, which leads to motor traffic accidents. It also poses risks while operating machinery, which also could lead to accidents. And it has been found that sleepy adolescents have significantly lower levels of academic performance. And they also say that sleepy adults can have compromised professional performance. These are two major disasters in our times. And the investigations into both these uh, catastrophes have revealed that the, the person responsible have been sleep deprived and hence sleepy when, when the error occurred. So what's the definition of excessive daytime sleepiness? It's defined as inability to maintain wakefulness and alertness during the major waking episodes of the day with sleep occurring unintentionally or at inappropriate times. And it has to be there for almost daily for at least three months. But, but we are not, I mean, if, if your patient is going to come and tell you that he's excessively sleep, you're not going to wait for three months. But on the other hand, most of the time, uh, when a patient comes and complains to you this, it would have been more than, more than many months. Right. So what can mimic, what can look like excessive daytime sleepiness before we can uh, get into uh, uh, I mean, investigating a patient with daytime sleepiness, we need to actually find out whether we are dealing with something else. So fatigue and tiredness are, are very closely uh, related words, but not, not really uh, going to be uh, uh, close to sleepiness because fatigue refers to the subjective lack of physical or mental energy, or, or in other words, it's the, it's the feeling of exhaustion that is brought on by the physical and mental exertion. So people with fatigue do not necessarily want to sleep. They just want to rest. So just make the distinction between these before uh, uh, setting about a journey on uh, sleepiness. Right. So, and then we should have a way of quantifying sleepiness objectively. So we have various questionnaires uh, that we can use to do this, but the most widely used questionnaire is the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, which can provide us with some insight into the patient's daytime sleepiness. So this is going to, uh, this, the, the questionnaire would have eight questions about patient's likelihood to fall asleep during various uh, daytime settings. So this is the questionnaire. Uh, these are the uh, situations that you are going to check whether they are, how quickly they are falling asleep, sitting and reading, watching TV, sitting inactive in a public place, as a passenger in a car for an hour, lying down to rest in the afternoon, sitting and talking to someone, sitting quietly after lunch, uh, and uh, in a car while stopped for a few minutes in traffic. So you have to tell, your patient has to tell how likely he would fall asleep in these situations, never or slight chance, moderate chance or highest chance, or depending on that, you would get, uh, you would give it a score. The maximum score you can got, get here is 24. And, and if the score is more than 10, that is going to objectively tell us that the patient is uh, having uh, a significant amount of sleepiness uh, during their time. So before we can embark on a journey in, in, in investigating a patient with daytime sleepiness, we need to do a few more things. Obviously, we are going to uh, know that we are going to discuss the possible causes and what to look for in the history and examination and, and, and about a few investigations. The history is so important in, in sleep medicine. We need to take a very detailed history from the patient. We're going to ask about the patient's sleep onset, sleep maintenance, and, and sleep termination, which means awakening in the morning, how refreshed you feel. And there will be lots of other things, but uh, you'll be learning all that when, as we go on. 
And it is very important that we take a collateral history or a parallel history from, from the bed partner or, or somebody who sleeps in the same room because it's very essential because there, there are things that happen during sleep that the patient is unaware of. So that, that's very essential. And we need to discuss with the patient about the patient's sleep hygiene and the sleep pattern. Now, I would make it a point to discuss a little about sleep hygiene at this point. So these are the recommendations from the National Sleep Foundation, the reference I have given below. So it's good to establish a regular bedtime. So go to, go to sleep at the same time every day. Avoid caffeine and other stimulants, especially in the latter part of the day. And regular exercises uh, seems to be helpful to, to give you a good night's sleep. Getting exposed to sunlight during the daytime is also thought to be helpful to, uh, to improve the quality of sleep. Make sure your sleep environment is comfortable. You have to have a comfortable temperature. It should not be too noisy and, and not too many lights. So your sleeping environment should be cool, quiet, and dark. And, and without other disturbances, obviously. And that's why they say, uh, sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Don't look at the clock at the night. So that's, that's another bad habit people have. Now, when you wake up in the night, you tend to look at the clock and that's, that, that is said to be bad. Now, if you want to wake up at a certain time in the morning, you set the alarm and that's it. Staying away from bright lights and bright screens before bedtime is also helpful to give you a good quality sleep. So uh, these are the recommendations from the National Sleep Foundation. So what are the investigations that we use in, in sleep medicine? So I have listed a few specific investigations, but we have a, a, a set of specific investigations that we, we use in sleep medicine. Lab-based polysomnography is, is one of the key investigations that we use. The patient needs to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, there's trained staff involved, and, and uh, it's an in-hospital sort of a test. As opposed to that, we have home sleep apnea testing, which is a limited test that, that would only look at the, the cardiorespiratory parameters, and that, that will only allow us to find out whether there are breathing problems associated with sleep. Overnight oximetry is simple. Wrist act actigraphy. Wrist actigraphy is a, a method of detecting uh, how active and inactive uh, we have been during a certain period of time. So it, it indirectly going to tell us uh, the times that we were sleeping as well as when we were awake. It's, it's a kind of a uh, gadget that we could wear and the rest, it's like a wristwatch. So that's going to detect our movements. Mean sleep latency test is uh, another test that we use. But I'm going to come back to it. So apart from these, we would do certain other tests uh, depending on the symptomatology and, and, the, and the patient. So we might arrange an EEG, MRI scan of the brain, neuropsychometric testing. Uh, there could be a few relevant blood tests and maybe lung function tests as well. So overnight polysomnography is one of the key tests that we use to assess uh, the sleep objectively. So uh, this allows us to measure several physiological parameters at the same time. So this assessment of the sleep stages would be done by uh, the, uh, you have a few EEG leads and there will be an electroculography to detect the eye movements. And then there'll be chin uh, EMG to detect the muscle atonia. So this would allow us to uh, assess the sleep stage. Then you need, uh, and we are monitoring the air flow. There'll be a few uh, ECG leads, uh, pulse oximetry, and the respiratory effort will be monitored by thorax or abdominal movement detectors. And there'll be a microphone or a sound recording to detect snoring. There'll be surface EMG uh, probes on the limbs to detect limb movements. And there'll be a continuous video monitoring. Multiple sleep latency tests consist of four to five nap opportunities each 20 minute, each 20 minute. Uh, uh, at, at two hour intervals. So a polysomnogram 
ideally precedes this MSLT to ensure, ensure a sufficient amount of sleep the night before, as well as to rule out other sleep disorders. And uh, the, the whole test should, um, actually the a whole test should precede, also should be preceded by sleep logs or a sleep diary or actigraphy uh, the week before to rule out, rule out insufficient sleep. The parameters of most interest in this test are mean sleep latency test, which means that, uh, what do you mean by sleep latency? Sleep latency is that given a chance to sleep, how quickly you fall asleep. So that's the sleep latency, so you take the mean of it and the number of sleep onset REM periods. So what is so REM? This is once you fall asleep, how quickly you enter into REM sleep. So if this happens within 15 minutes of falling asleep, that is considered as a, a sleep onset REM period. So MSLT is a major factor now in current classification systems, uh, particularly in patients with hypersomnolence disorders. So at this stage, I thought before going into causes of excessive daytime sleepiness, it's good to uh, give you a, a, a brief idea about the classification of sleep disorders in general, just to know where we are. So good old days, the classification was simple. We had insomnias, parasomnias, and hypersomnias. Insomnia is simple as the word means. Parasomnias are various uh, funny things that can happen during sleep and hypersomnia is excess of sleep. So that was the previous classification, but now uh, uh, the International Classification of Sleep Disorders have grouped all sleep disorders into six major categories, I've listed them here. And as, as we go on, I'll be discussing uh, some of them, but not, I'm not going to talk about insomnias or parasomnias. So these are the six uh, disorders that uh, six groups that uh, all the sleep disorders will be included here. So what are the causes of excessive daytime sleepiness? So this is going to be uh, going to take some time and that will be a major portion of my talk. And, and uh, there'll be many pearls here. So definitely more than 10 pearls. So if your patient is too sleepy, Either the, your patient is not sleeping enough, it could be either forced or chosen, or else, despite sleeping enough, he's still sleepy. So it's very simple. There can be only two things. So let's get a little technical now. If you're not sleeping enough, it could be either insufficient amount of sleep, or it is poor quality of sleep. The other group is fair. You, despite the normal quality and quantity of sleep, your patient is still feel sleepy. And that's, that indicates a central disorder of hypersomnolence. So if you're not sleeping enough, there could be a few things. It could be insufficient amount of sleep, or it could be poor quality sleep due to a sleep-related breathing disorder or a sleep-related movement disorder, or it could be a circadian rhythm disorder. So we'll, I'll be coming back into uh, all these things insufficient sleep syndrome. Now, as a society, we don't sleep enough. Now, uh, this, is, this is voluntary sleep restriction. Now, this, is, uh, this has be become a global problem and this, the most the most probably the, the commonest cause for excessive daytime sleepiness. We all, we all want to do more, achieve more, and we are doing this at the expense of sleep. Now, if you look at the recommendations from the American Sleep Academy, and, this American, uh, and the National Sleep Foundation, school-going children should sleep eight to nine hours a day. I mean, for adults, it is seven to eight hours. So we need to think uh, whether we are sleeping this much. But insufficient sleep, sleep syndrome is when somebody's sleeping less than, uh, sleeping five hours or less on a regular basis, and that is where uh, there are going to be problems. So there'll be a sleep debt, and the sleep debt going to accumulate and if you don't repair the debt and there'll be a point where uh, you'll be moody, irritable and your performance can suffer. So the management is easy. You ask the patient to sleep more and that solves the problem. Sleep-related breathing disorders. 
So obstructive sleep apnea is a common problem. Yeah, you would have repetitive episodes of partial or complete obstruction of the upper airway during sleep, leading to oxygen desaturation and fragmentation of sleep. It's a highly prevalent condition and grossly underdiagnosed. So the patients would complain of non-restorative sleep or un they're not feeling refreshed in the morning and then and, uh, fatigue. And in the night, they uh, may wake up with breath holding sp uh, spells or gasping. The observers or the bed partner will report heavy snoring and, and breathing interruptions. This condition could be associated with hypertension, diabetes, and as well as cardiovascular disease. So to diagnose, the history is very important. Uh, there's actually a score uh, named Stop Bang score where you ask eight questions that gives us an idea about the likelihood of the patient suffering from OSA. So as for snoring, T for tired, uh, O for observed breathing process, blood pressure, having high blood pressure, body mass index more than 35, age over 50, neck circumference more than 40 centimeters, and gender being male. So uh, eight points, uh, eight questions. And if you have a score of more than five, that will indicate a high likelihood that the patient is suffering from obstructive sleep apnea. Then uh, you need to organize a polysomnography or a home sleep study to demonstrate the obstructive sleeping, obstructive respiratory events. This picture just to illustrate the difference between central and obstructive sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea is where you have a pause or cessation of both airflow and the ventilatory effort during sleep as opposed to obstructive sleep apnea. Sleep-related movement disorders, that's another interesting uh, area in sleep medicine. Uh, these are the two uh, uh, common conditions that I've listed, restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is where your patient would complain about a creepy crawly sensation in their legs with an irresistible urge to move their legs, particularly at the times when they're resting, when they're inactive. And obviously that's going to come when you're preparing to sleep, when you're getting ready to sleep. So that's going to uh, delay the onset of sleep and, and cause problems. So. This condition could be associated with um, anemia and renal failure, but it's largely idiopathic. Standard management is by giving dopamine agonists, but um, in, in the recent times we have found that even gabapentin, pregabalin, uh, these drugs also can be helpful. Periodic limb movement disorder is where there are recurrent leg movements during non-REM sleep, but at the same time, you need to remember that just because uh, somebody is moving their legs during sleep, that doesn't, I mean, they won't be qualified into this diagnosis. And periodic limb movements are particularly common in elderly. So uh, this diagnosis would be considered only if your patient is having limb movements more than 15 times per hour, uh, which can disrupt the quality of sleep. Circadian rhythm is a, a, a key process that controls our sleep. So that's a self-sustaining uh, biological clock or a biological system, biological cycle with a periodicity of 24 hours. So there can be problems with uh, circadian rhythm, which cause uh, problems with the sleep. So delayed sleep-wake phase disorder is where your natural sleep time is little delayed. So typical patient would naturally, their bedtime is around one or two o'clock in the morning. So obviously, but they're going to sleep normally. Their quantity and quality of sleep is normal and, and they, cannot, they will wake up naturally a little late. But the problem here is if they want to go to work or uh, to wake up for study, that is problematic. So advanced sleep wake phase disorder is just the reverse of that. The patient's natural uh, bedtime is something like 7 p.m. in the evening. So that's socially and unacceptable. And if they sleep around that time, they're obviously going to wake up by two or three o'clock in the morning and that, that's a problem. So jet lag is when you move to a different time zone, you, it takes a little while for your body clocks to adjust to that new time zone. And shift work is another huge problem. 
uh, which would disrupt your circadian rhythm. If you work a day shift this week and night shift ne next week, that's going to heavily upset your circadian rhythm. And these people have poor quality sleep. Central disorders of hypersomnolence, and that is where, I said this earlier, uh, you're feeling sleepy despite having normal quality and quantity of nocturnal sleep. So uh, these are the uh, disorders of uh, central disorders of hypersomnolence. Uh, I'm going to come back to each, each of these conditions um, in, a, in a little while. So narcolepsy is one of the most interesting conditions uh, which causes excessive daytime sleepness. The typical features would be uh, sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is where the patient wakes up from sleep feeling you know, with, with a total muscle atonia. So that could be very frightening. And, uh, and then they would also have hallucinations at the sleep onset and sleep offset. That's called hypnogogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. And, and then cataplexy. Cataplexy is interesting. There, there will be sudden loss of muscle tone in response to a positive emotion, particularly with laughter. So when you hear a joke, the patient might collapse to the ground or loses muscle tone and part of their body, that could be a head drop or, or something like that. So the etiology of this condition is thought to be loss of hypothalamic hypocretin neurons, particularly in type 1. And the diagnosis is by the way of uh, MSL, typical history, uh, clinical findings and MSLT, and also with a low CSF hypocretin level. Narcolepsy type one is when you have cataplexy and type two is when you don't have cataplexy. Uh, and, and type two uh, also don't show low CSF hypocretin levels consistently, but they also should have typical MSLT findings. So, MSLT, uh, these are the typical MSLT uh, features that you're going for. The mean sleep latency less than eight minutes and more than two sleep onset REM periods. This is just a poster. Uh, not only humans uh, have, get narcolepsy, even cats may have. Uh, these are narcoleptic cat. That's why the unusual uh, way the cat is sleeping. Idiopathic hypersomnia is a similar condition to narcolepsy, but this would not have the typical features or specific features of narcolepsy like cataplexy or sleep attacks or sleep paralysis won't be here uh, commonly. Uh, these people also sleep for prolonged hours. And uh, despite that, it's difficult for them to wake up in the morning. And even when they wake up, there'll be a prolonged sleep inertia. So the management aspects would also be similar to narcolepsy. Klein-Levin syndrome is an extremely rare condition where the patient presents with relapsing and remitting episodes so severe hypersomnolence. They, they sleep for very long hours, maybe something like 15 hours a day, uh, people sleep. Uh, and, and, and even when they're awake, their behavior and, uh, and their, there will be behavioral and psychological issues as well as hyperphagia. So typical attack would last for about one or two weeks and the attack will spontaneously result. Without any treatment, they get back to normal and, and they're normal. But another attack might come in a few months time. So this condition could be easily mistaken with a, with a recurrent encephalopathy. Various medical disorders or neurological problems can also be the cause behind excessive daytime sleepiness. You know, head injury, brain tumors, uh, strokes, depending on the location, particularly thalamic strokes, hypothalamic lesions, Parkinson's disease. We know people complain of uh, sleepiness, multiple sclerosis, myotonic dystrophy, a certain proportion of patients uh, has uh, excessive sleepiness. Hypersomnia due to, medic due to a medication or substance use. Now, in this day and age of polypharmacy, we know lots of drugs can cause drowsiness or sedation as a side effect. We know antihistamines, um, antiepileptics, antidepressants, psychiatric drugs. So there are lots of drugs which can cause drowsiness or sedation as, as one of the side effects. So um, when you're dealing with a patient, you need to check about this as well. At the same time, you remember that stimulant withdrawal can also lead to sleepiness. 
Hypersomnia associated with a psychiatric disorder. This is a controversial entity, but at least it's good to know that uh, major depression can have uh, been a certain proportion of patients with major depression can have sleepiness as a symptom. And we know lots of psychiatric drugs also can cause sleepiness. So going into a management, and I just thought I would just uh, discuss management of hypersomnolence disorders in general. The goal of treatment is to curtail daytime sleepiness. And narcolepsy uh, uh, patients could be helped by shed with some scheduled naps. Wake promoting medication, uh, we use these drugs to uh, keep them awake, modafinil, methylphenidate, amphetamines, uh, they're quite useful. And the same drugs could be uh, also used in idiopathic uh, hypersomnia, but that's not FDA approved yet. So demoxibate is a drug designed for cataplexy uh, specifically, and that is also a useful option. And in general, people who have hypersomnia disorders must avoid driving for obvious, obvious reasons. Now, we, we usually know that there's a, there's a huge delay in diagnosing these disorders uh, in most of the time. So what are, what are the stumbling blocks in the way of the diagnosis? Now, why is, it, why is it so difficult for us to diagnose sleep disorders? One major reason is that awareness is poor. Awareness is poor among general public, even the patient or the family members, they, they, they are not, their awareness, just because their awareness is poor, they might not take it as a significant uh, problem. Now, if you're, one of your family members are feeling, uh, telling that they're more sleepy, the others might think that they're lazy. And even when you go to primary care physicians, they also might not, uh, not diagnose you uh, quickly, you know, because they may not be very knowledgeable about the sleep medicine. Right? They also might think that you're lazy or you're, you're depressed, and there are instances where patients have been prescribed antidepressants for sleepiness. So, uh, and even when they identify, there could be the wrong referral. So there have been instances where uh, cataplectic attacks have been referred to cardiologists saying drop attacks. And, and uh, there had been also instances where cataplectic attacks have been referred to psychiatrists telling these are uh, psychogenic attacks. So e e these things can happen. And then the third thing is shortage of facilities or how many sleep labs we have. We have fully fledged sleep, uh, a sleep lab with facilities to do overnight polysomnography with MSLT. So um, the, the country has only a few of them. And uh, the other thing is patients might have multiple uh, sleep problems overlapping with each other, which requires a logical approach. One, one good example is that people with narcolepsy can be little obese and uh, they, they may have, a, have an element of obstructive sleep apnea. So uh, their OSA is getting the diagnosis and their manager is an OSA patient. So their diagnosis of narcolepsy could be delayed. So at last, um, I'll have to say sleep neurology is so interesting. It's interesting uh, because that includes a myriad of fascinating diagnostic considerations that in that requires broad interdisciplinary clinical, neurophysiological, pharmacological, and management expertise. And sleep neurology also has the capability of improving functioning and quality of life in our patients. Thank you.